Okay, welcome everybody to our Healthy Aging webinar. This is Food and Fitness and Tai Chi After 50. And I'm Diane Bailey, I'm the creator of the Open the Door to Tai Chi system. And my guest today is Dr. Christine Rosenblum. And she has a wealth of information for us today because of her very long tenured background in the world of nutrition. And she is, uh, she's, Professor Emerita at Georgia State. Um, she owns, she's the president of the Chris Rosenblum Food and Nutrition um, Company that has a blog that supports the book that she helped write um, with Dr. Bob Murray, Food and Fitness After 50. And this is really the basis of what we're gonna be talking about today. So thank you, Dr. Rosenblum. Is it okay if I call you Christine? Please do, Diane. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we, uh, when I saw the book, and the book actually was introduced to me from a mutual friend that Christine and I have, Chris Cinnamon, who is, um, if you've joined our Healthy Aging webinars, you know that he is um, with Chicago Tai Chi. And he actually introduced Christine and I because of this common interest in food and fitness after 50. I am the creator of the Open the Door to Tai Chi system, but I'm also the owner of a studio here in Denver, the conditioning classroom, where we focus on training the mature adult. And that's the way we like to see it. We don't mm -hmm. like to say older or elder, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the mature adult. And it is so important to help the mature adult be fit and to help them understand that the choices they make are critical to continuing to do the things they love to do. And what really resonated with me after reading the book, Food and Fitness After 50, is that you have such a, a balanced approach that it's not a wild and crazy, one size fits all. Um, it, it is a, a great roadmap. So if you don't have the book, I do actually encourage you to pick it up. It is on Amazon, Food and Fitness After 50. It's a great um, compendium of information and it's split up into three sections and it's eat well, move well, and be well. And those three sections are critical to helping you age well. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And if you have questions, which I'm sure you will as we go through this, as Christine and I talk, I want you to put the questions into the chat. If you will, just put those questions. And if it seems to be something that will um, carry, on with the conversation, we'll put it in right at the, that time, but I may just wait for your questions to the end as well. So don't be offended if I don't answer your question right away, <laughs> we'll get to it. Okay, Christine, thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here today, all the way from Georgia. Um, isn't it kind of fun that we have the technology to sit and talk like this? It is great. And I appreciate you um, having me on, Diane. I know we've been talking about this for a few months. And I'm glad that it happened. And as I told you a couple of days ago, despite being vaccinated and boosted, I'm on day five of having COVID. So my voice is about an octave lower than normal. <laughs> so otherwise, I'm feeling pretty good. And, and I think just, you know, taking a shower and washing my hair really helped boost my mood. So right. there we go. <laughs> So I'm glad that we were able to do this and I, I appreciate you uh, having me on. Yes. And, and thank you so much for, you know, I, I, you and I had talked and, and I really appreciate you being willing to continue with this. <laughs> yeah, I definitely so, am ready. This morning, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that said, how old are you really? And it says, what is your biological age? Which I found that very interesting. We have a lot of um, research happening right now about healthy aging, which is appropriate because mm -hmm. we are aging, you know, uh, large, huge sections of our country 
the boomers, and now even the Gen Xers are coming into that older generation and we're staying healthy and we're staying alive. So these kind of um, discussions are important. One of the um, uh, people that they interviewed in this Wall Street Journal is Dr. Royzen, um, who's at the Cleveland Clinic. And he made an interesting comment. He said, your choices have much more profound effect than just changing whether your heart is beating fast or slow. So those choices are what we're gonna talk about today. And Christine, as the expert in nutrition, with all your years of nutrition, um, what is the number one question that you're asked about nutrition and aging healthy? I think the number one question I get asked is what's the best? Everybody wants to know what's the best diet, what's the best food, is there a superfood? And my response is that there's no one best, there's lots of goods. And so you really have to think of what really meets your lifestyle. You know, we talk a lot today about sustainability when it comes to agriculture and the land and how we raise food, but I think your diet also has to be sustainable. And I talk to plenty of people that have been on keto or they go low carb or they go all carnivore or whatever it is, but it's not sustainable. You can't do that forever. I mean, there may be those one or two people out there that can, but for the most of us, we want to eat a diet that meets our needs, that's good for us, that's healthy, and that's an enjoyable part. I think we all often forget that food should be enjoyed and we should enjoy it with our friends and family and loved ones. Um, and some people yet are so fearful of their food and they want to be on one special diet their whole life. So I think that there are many good options, but there isn't any one best. You know, and I love that attitude because as we age, maybe we get to um, a, more, a, a more awareness mm -hmm. of we want to enjoy what we're doing, right? right? We Absolutely. don't want to just on the exercise side, we don't wanna just ground and pound and beat our body into submission. I actually wanna enjoy what I'm doing. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Eating is the same way. You know? yep. um, and it, it's interesting with my clients, I, uh, they ask me a lot about nutrition and mm -hmm. I'm not a dietitian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we approach eating as, uh, um, we want you to eat well. We want you to eat close to nature, you know, as mm -hmm. unprocessed as possible, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, we want it, you to eat well 80% of the time. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think that's part of what you say in the book, too, is enjoying that, but still being able to have birthday cake or whatever. Right, right. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important point because. You know, like we've said, been saying, food is meant to be enjoyed. And all of the diet plans that are out there that we recommend, things like a Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, or this um, the flexitarian diet, which is you know mostly plant based, but then gives you the option um, to eat meat or fish on occasion. And then even the newest one that's popular is the Mind diet, the one mm -hmm. about. Um, neurodegenerative delay, they all have the same principles in common, which is, as you have mentioned, more whole unprocessed foods, uh, leaner cuts of meat if you choose meat, um, lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, dark colored fruits and vegetables that give you those anthocyanins, the phytochemicals that can help with your brain function. And so, so they all have basic principles so they're the same but they, they might focus on one thing a little differently. A Mediterranean diet mo might focus more on olive oil and maybe that glass of red wine with the meal. Uh, whereas a, a flexitarian plan may focus a lot more on a plant-based meal with just occasional uh, meat. So they're all very similar. And I think whatever one of those meets your lifestyle is one of the best reasons to eat that way. I don't think there's one that's just the perfect one for everyone. And you talk a lot about in the book, you, I know, which I love the, the whole structure of the book where you, you talk about, you know, clarifying the science and you mm -hmm. talk about actually, you know, confronting the myths yeah. um, and with nutrition in particular, there are a lot of myths. There yeah. are yeah. a lot, there's a lot of misinformation yes. out there. Yes. Um, and I love in the book too, you talk about um, supplements 
and describing the benefits of the supplements, but also talking about, you know, where do they really fit in? Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that the, the first part that you mentioned is this idea of um, nutrition. I like to say nutrition is the best of times and worst of times and the best of times because, you know, with, with apologies to famous authors, but, uh, you know, it, I mean, people are interested in nutrition and that's so good. The bad news is that everybody's an expert, you know, I eat, therefore I know. And we have all these social media influencers who, you know, just they're making lots of money and making a living off giving people um, misinformation, in some cases, disinformation, you know, they want people to be really confused to buy whatever it is they're selling. So that's very frustrating. You know, when I became a dietitian, nobody wanted to be a dietitian. We were the clinical, um, you know, food police in the hospital. But <laughs> nowadays, everybody's interested in that. Um, and then in terms of the supplement piece that you mentioned, there are lots of good reasons to use supplements if they supplement your diet. You know, they're not meant to be a substitute. And there isn't, just like there's not one best diet, there isn't one best supplement that you should take. Um, and I think that whole supplement aisle, whether it's in your local big box retail store or your local drug store, it's so confusing. Even for somebody like me who's, who studied probiotics, it's really hard to go in there and decide what might be the best supplement and why do I even need this supplement? So I think sometimes we just well, every, my, my friend's taken one, maybe I should take one too, you know, instead of really thinking, is this something I really need? And is it something, could I get it from my diet first, and then maybe see how I could augment my diet with the supplement? I think that that's an interesting point too, that people try to diagnose themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm potassium deficient or right. I'm magnesium right. deficient. Right. Um, I, I think that that's a really dangerous approach. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. one of Dr. the- Dr. Google. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. <laughs> and one of the ideas behind the book too is if you're eating well, you know, the whole section is called eating well. Mm -hmm. If you're eating well, you should, you, you, you should actually be covering all the bases. Yeah. Yeah. And then if something goes haywire in your body, you know, you and your physician can talk about perhaps there is a supplementation or, or there is something that you need in addition to, but um, you know, the whole idea of diagnosing yourself yeah. <laughs> is very dangerous. And we yeah. talk about that a lot in our yeah. studio here. And I think a good example of that right now is with vitamin D. You know, there's been so much talk about vitamin D deficiency, especially in, in, in mature adults, you know, in older populations. And, um, and then especially with COVID, you know, a lot of people talking about vitamin D as, as, as a, a nutrient that is important for your immune system. And it is important for your immune system. But unless you know what your vitamin D level is, which is a pretty simple blood test that your physician can do, I don't ever recommend people start taking mega doses of vitamin D. If you're taking a multivitamin mineral supplement, well formulated for a person over 50, you're probably getting sufficient vitamin D in that multi. You don't need to start piling it on unless you know what your blood level is. So it's that gets to exactly to your point, Diane, about self-diagnosis. Right. And, and we do have, Agnes was just asking, what is the best way to find your vitamin and nutrient deficiencies if you eat a very healthy whole food diet? Um, you know, how would you answer that question? I mean, I really wish we were still, I wish we had that technology like they do on Star Trek, you know, where they can just scan you and tell you every <laughs> nutrient level in your body. I've been waiting for that for 40 years. Uh, we don't have it yet, uh, but there's really no easy way. To, there's no simple blood test that will tell you all of your nutrient levels. So I think for, for most people, what I always used to do with my students is I'd have them do a very detailed three-day food diary and then use some online free computer program to analyze their diet. And it'll give you an idea of what you're getting in your diet. And you might find that, um, boy, I'm doing pretty good with calcium, but, but maybe I need 300 milligrams more. Well, it's easy to get that one more serving of yogurt, um, you know, a serving of kefir, you know, something out, cottage cheese, some way to get that instead of jumping to a supplement. So I think that's a really easy way to do that. And um, the USDA MyPlate, you know, has that nutrition software that you can do that. So I think that's one way. Um, but then as you get older, I think having your doctor talk to you about vitamin D deficiency, looking at your, your blood levels of vitamin D, 
getting a bone density, that's gonna be the best way to know what your bones are doing and if you might need more vitamin D or calcium. But again, that self-diagnosis piece is really not the best way to go. That is dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I know that you have um, traveled with your co-author, Bob mm -hmm. Murray. Um, tell us a little bit, you know, the, the section Move Well, yeah. um, which is actually, you know, his, his part yes. of the book. But, yeah. you know, what do people ask? What's the number one question you hear about, you know, moving well? Yeah, it's the same question. What's the best? Uh, what's the best? And, you know, what can I get away with? Basically, you know, what can, what can I do that's easy and quick and get away with it? And um, as you mentioned, Bob is an exercise physiologist, and that's his area of expertise. So, you know, he, he likes to say that it's, um, you have to do three things, you still have to work on the aerobics, because it's important to keep your heart and lungs in good working condition. Um, you have to work on your strength. That's really important because around the age of 40, we start to lose that muscle mass if we're not active. And, you know, it's pretty easy to turn back the clock when it comes to muscle mass and strength with strength training. But then the third part, which gets into what you, you love, is the ABCs, the agility, the balance, and coordination. And that's where something like Tai Chi comes in, yoga, um, anything to keep you moving and keep your agility um, I like to do dance aerobics. I'm a terrible dancer, but doing that a couple mornings a week with my friends, I feel like at least I'm moving in different directions, you know, and I'm getting a little aerobics at the same time. I think that those, those are the three main areas, and we would love people to choose a little bit from each column. You know, <laughs> we need to do all three of those. One isn't superior to the others, but then there are some exercises like, you know, with Tai Chi that can work on the agility, balance, and coordination, but it can also be muscle strengthening as well. So finding yeah. exercises you like to do. Right. And and that is an, a, a very important piece. What we were just talking about with food is you have to like what you're yes. doing. You have to enjoy it. And this is something that when I do presentations, I talk about Tai Chi as a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's not the entire puzzle. Okay. Um, but because we do need to work cardiovascularly, we do need to work on strength. And that's why I have the conditioning classroom, the studio, but we do also need to add that balance coordination. Um, it, I call it the softer side of exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm 61. I, I, I have been a martial artist for 30 years. I love to punch and kick things. I tell it <laughs> that. Um, but I know that Tai Chi, adding that softer side of exercise, has actually allowed me to continue into my 60s to do the hard forms of exercise. Mm. Um, I retired, I taught kickboxing for 18 years. And um, a, I retired at 55. And about at age 52, I started to really clue in that, oh gosh, you know, I'm spending more money on chiropractor, on massage, on PT, my shoulders are toast. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, I, I'm out of balance. Mm -hmm. I am out of balance. I have gone too far on the hard side of things yeah. and I need to balance myself out. And once I did that, once I got my Tai Chi more in balance with my harder side, then my body started to be healthy again. And it appreciated that balance. So yeah. when we, like you said, those what's best, what's the best exercise? Well, we actually need a, a whole conglom conglomeration. Yeah. Um, it's like if all we had on our plate was spinach, <laughs> you know, spinach is very healthy. That's not a healthy diet. You know, right. if you lived on spinach, your body is not meant to just live on spinach, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So your body needs to move in different ways. And that's what we're all about at Open the Door to Tai Chi is helping people understand that it's a piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece of the puzzle. And that resonated with me in the book as well, that you know, there's a whole chapter on um, balance, agility, flexibility, 
um, talking about preventing falls. Yeah. Uh, tai Chi is very good at, and there's multiple studies on how Tai Chi helps people be more balanced in a physical way. You know, mm -hmm. we were just talking about balance in a different way, but helping them uh, lower their risk of falls, yeah. which is yeah. really critical as we age, right? We're both in that baby boomer generation. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I turned 71 a couple of weeks ago, so I, I hear you. And um, yeah. falls, fall prevention is so important. And that, like you said, one of the, one of the most well-documented benefits of Tai Chi is, um, is fall prevention, as well as probably helping with knee pain and knee osteoarthritis. Right. But I think that fall prevention is so important. And sometimes I look at some of my older colleagues and how they shuffle, you know, mm -hmm. when they walk, they're not really picking up their feet. Um, and they're not paying attention. You know, their mind is somewhere Wait. else as they're walking down the stairs carrying a load of wash um, or they're going to trip over the dog or throw a rug. And so all of those things, I think that's where some of those mindful activities too can help you. So not just with the balance and coordination, but then with that mindfulness of doing one thing at a time and Absolutely. not spreading yourself too thin. Right. And and we're, we'll come back to that, you know, when we come to this section of the be well, we've yeah. kind of the eat well, move well yeah. a little bit. Um, we'll come back to talking about that mindful with be well. Yeah. But I want to ask you, there's a term that I really, I don't like, but I want to see what you like. And that's called anti-aging. You know, yeah. what, what is your thought on that? I hate that too. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like pro-aging and I'm pro-aging because I, I think to me, there's this idea of we're going to, we're going to fight aging. We're not going to age, you know, and, and we're going to age. I mean, I don't care what you say. You can take an animal and put it in a sterile, stress-free cage environment, and they're still going to age. So no matter what we do, we're going to age. So I think learning to age with grace, learning to age and accept what it is that we have, um, learning to, to count our blessings and appreciate what we have and age well. Uh, I, I really don't like this, you know, what can I do to prevent aging? Uh, and I want to say nothing. That's exactly what you can do. But you can feel better at 65 than you did at 45 if you're eating well and you're moving well and you're practicing some of these other things. So depending on your, your diet and your lifestyle and your activity, um, you can feel better at 65 than you did at 45. It just depends on what you choose to do. I think so much of aging is really what people think is negative of aging is disuse. Mm. And I think right. that's a big, big part of it. I think this whole disuse and uh, I mean, it's not easy. You were very active. I kind of came at it the other way. I never started to exercise until I was 25 years old. I was a cardiac rehab dietitian. I worked with this amazing physician who had one of the earliest cardiac rehab programs. And he made the patients exercise from three to five on Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the gym. And patients had to dress out. And he said to his staff, you have to dress out too. I want you in shorts and t-shirts. And you're going to walk with the staff or jog with the staff or the, the patients and get to know them. And so I couldn't even run one lap around the gym at age 25. And here's this you know, 70 year old with triple bypass surgery, you know, laughing me. And I started to jog with cardiac patients. And then before long, I thought, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very, in very good shape for a 25 year old. So I started running and, and I hooked up with a buddy, my sister-in-law, and we ran the little 3k, then 5k and then 10k road races. And it was a social thing. We were never good. We were never fast. We were never going to win anything, but we really enjoyed it. And that really helped me learn the benefits of physical activity. And then the more I studied health and aging, the more I realized how important all these other things were, like the strength training piece and then the agility and balance and coordination. So I kind of came at it late, but I've not given it up either. No. I've changed things, like you said, I've changed some things. But well, I and, and that is actually a really important um, point to make, which I, I do with my clients here in the studio all the time is it is never too late to right. start right just because you've gotten into your 60s and you realize oh my gosh i can't travel because i i can't yeah. take the the stress i can't take the walking i can't right. i can't do it it it's not too late to start and i think it's a really great point really good right it it and again that's one of the things about tai chi 
that um, is, it's a great entry level kind of activity mm -hmm. that um, people that have never exercised, they, they can enjoy it, they can get used to that movement, help their balance, mm -hmm. but it, it is um, not intimidating um, yeah. because it's, it's not all the, um, the weights or whatever they're, they're right. thinking. A, a lot of the women are very afraid of weights, which they shouldn't be, right. but, <laughs> but it's a great entry level activity as well. Um, yeah. I think it's a great point. And another thing that I like to talk about with fitness is the idea of functional fitness. Ah, now, I'm not going to be a bodybuilder, right. Right. but I had, I always said I had two goals in mind when I, as I age, I wanted to be able to lift my own suitcase in the overhead bin when I traveled. I love to travel and I don't want to be one of those damsels in distress in the middle of the <laughs> aisle, waiting Good. for the strong stranger to come and help me. I've got to lift Good. my own darn suitcase. And then the second thing is I have a big dog. I actually had two big dogs, but now I'm down to one. And I wanted to be able to go to, to the local store and buy a 50 pound bag of dog food, you know, and get it on the shelf into my cart and into my car. And so those were things that, that sound silly, but they're important to me. And I think that's the idea of functional fitness. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to get on the floor and play with your grandkids and then be able to get back up? Uh, you know, do you want to continue right. to burden when you're stooping and bending and pulling and all that stuff? You know, so what is it that you love to do and what is it that you want to continue to do as you age? And I think that's where the exercise piece comes in. It lets you continue to do what you love to do. And the fun thing about it, too, is that the food side and the exercise side actually, and, and we talk about this in my studio, mm -hmm. is we want them to support each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your eating needs to support what your goals are, your exercise needs to support what your goals are. And like you said, very few of us have the goal of being a bodybuilder. You know, it's, it's inspirational to see those pictures of, you know, 80 year old um, women that are doing bodybuilding, but it's, it's also unrealistic for the majority of us. Right. And that's not what exercise is all about. That's not what eating well is all about. What you're saying is exercise and eating well is helping you continue to do the things you love to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the approach. That's why I loved your book is because it feels like, ah, you know, somebody is just telling me that I can do what I love to do, even into my 80s, into my 90s. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, and uh, this is not guarantee there there are things that are thrown at us we right. are aging okay yeah. you said anti-aging is not really what the goal is it's healthy aging or pro-aging you know aging successfully mm -hmm. that it's um yeah there's going to be things that are going to might be taken away from us um i kickboxing has not been taken away from me necessarily mm -hmm. but that every day kickboxing has been okay yeah. it, it's yeah. gone but um you know i will never bench press 100 pounds again oh well <laughs> yeah right. that's yeah. not exactly a you know lifetime that yeah. i need to do right yeah. but i can get on the floor and play with my grandkids i can chase them around the yard mm -hmm. um they will remember grandma as you know active and, and that's yeah. what i want yeah. is I want that kind of aging. Yeah. And I think that goes into another thing that I hear a lot with people. They'll say, well, you know, my, my lifespan, I, I want to live to 100. I want to live to 120. It's like, you know, you really focus on your health span. Mm -hmm. You want to be as healthy as you can in the years that you have. You know, I don't, I, you know, I've never met anybody who said, I want to live to 120, but those last 20 years, I want to be in a nursing home. No, <laughs> that's not what anybody wants. It might happen. And, and sometimes it does, but you know, we want to think about our health span, how healthy can we be until the end, so we don't have to have a lot of disability and lose our independence. And, and so think about it more from a health span than a lifespan perspective. That's awesome. You know, I, I like to tell people, you know, we want to be healthy, 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 dead. Yeah, exactly. That's the way to go. <laughs> None of us gets out of this alive. Okay, right, exactly. None of us gets out of right. this alive. Right, so right. let's be as healthy as we can and not just have this long, slow yes. decline. Let's right. keep ourselves healthy. Right. And that's what eat well, move well, be well is all about. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about that be well section yeah. of the book. And um, that is a little bit more like managing your stress levels, um, thinking about you know why you're doing what you're doing. You know, talk a little bit about that part of the book. Yeah, I think that both Bob and I, when we got to that part, realized that even though you're eating well and you're moving well, stuff happens. Uh, you know, so as we all know, um, Bob has had um, cardiac arrhythmia since he was a teenager. So he's had multiple uh, ablations, and you know he's worked through that, and he's still very active. But that's a, that's something that's in his life. Um, I had um, a hip replacement about the age of 62. I was a runner and I overdid it. You know, like you're saying, I just choose, chose one activity. That was the thing I could get done fast, get it over with. And finally my hip gave out. And I think when I had that hip replacement, the um, doctor said to me, you know, you, let's see, you're 62. Let's see, um, this will last 25 years. That's probably all you got left. So don't, <laughs> so don't, so don't, uh, don't do those high impact exercises anymore. Now, if you absolutely have to run and that's all you'll do, well, okay. But notice that this isn't going to last as long. So it was sort of that moment. Well, okay, what else can I do? Well, I like to swim. I like to cycle. I like to walk, you know, so I did more low impact stuff and I've been continued to do that. And that's worked out quite well. So, you know, it's that idea of stuff's going to happen. So what is it that you can do to stay and be well? And so we do talk about um, managing your stress. No such thing as a stress-free life. I don't care how much money you have or what your wealth status is, you know, there's stress. And so the, the thing that researchers have found is that people that have a lot of resilience that can take stress and deal with it in an appropriate way, one of the best ways to deal with stress, as you know, Diane, is through activity and exercise. It's just a great stress releaser. So instead of reaching for a glass of wine, how about going for a walk with your dog? You know, something to, to help you alleviate that stress before you turn to something that might not help you in the long run. So we, look, we talk about stress management and talk about sleep. And everybody's, you know, really on that bandwagon these days. COVID has made a lot of people anxious and, and, and people aren't sleeping as well. So things to, to, to work on the sleep hygiene environment so that you can get a good night's sleep. Um, and then um, social support, which is, is another really important aspect. Um, a group of researchers at Harvard have been tracking this um, Harvard adult development uh, program for years. And they found, which is interesting to me, especially for men, the social support is what really helped them have healthy aging. Women tend to be better with social support and they tend to be the social connectors with spouses. But now they're finding that, you know, sometimes men, when they're widowed, they don't, they don't have that social network. So having strong social support is also very good for your health. So I think exercise ties into so much of that too. If you're being active, you're going to sleep better. If you're, for most people, exercise also involves other people. So there's that social support. I belong to a, a small YMCA and I just love to see the internet actions and the connections that these people make at the Y, whether it's silver sneakers or the Tai Chi class or pickleball, they're really great social connectors. So I think that all three of those really fit well together. It, uh, it's interesting because Tai Chi, um, you know, it's probably one of the most studied forms of exercise. There, there, there are thousands, literally thousands of studies and it is proven to lower stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. It is proven to improve sleep quality. And it is proven to help with that feeling more vigorous and that whole idea of being connected to a community. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's described uh, oftentimes as movement meditation. Mm -hmm. And if you've never done um, Tai Chi before, um, it's, once you get into knowing those underlying principles and actually applying them and letting your body relax into the movement, it really is a very meditative form of exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I often say too, is calling back to that mindful statement mm -hmm. um, with Tai Chi, if you're not in the moment, if you're not thinking about what you're doing, what's coming next, are you applying the underlying principles of um, being rooted and grounded, of understanding your rotation, of your breathing? If you're not in the moment, you will get lost. 
-hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a great form of meditation, which is in turn a great way to deal with stress in your life as yeah. well. So yeah. again, that Tai Chi is a piece of the overall healthy aging puzzle. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think of, uh, you know, like kickboxing mm -hmm. it, or relieving stress, you know, I want to beat something, <laughs> which it, I, I have to admit, sometimes that does work. <laughs> Sometimes that's great, but you have to realize that that's actually adding stress on stress on stress. Yeah. You're actually putting your body in more stress when you're doing that mm -hmm. really heavy exercise. Yeah. So adding Tai Chi as something to help you manage your stress, help your body relax and open up is actually something very important for you to do as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, there is a the piece of the... Um, whole overall i thought it was interesting you talked about a club sandwich generation <laughs> yeah. that they're that kind of stress that people around our age are caring for parents yeah. maybe caring for children maybe caring for grandchildren yeah you call that a club sandwich right, right. generation which that's that that's a lot of stress yeah yeah and i i see that i, I my parents aren't alive but my husband's um, mother is, and his sister, who's an RN, um, she's caring, helping to care for her. She helped care for her elderly parents until her father died. And now she's caring for her elderly mother. She has two sons who she helps take care of them and they have lots of children and she helps take care of all those wow. children. So wow. she's sort of the connector in the whole family. Mm -hmm. And I just see that on her. Now she's pretty good about taking care of her own health, but she definitely puts everybody else first. And I think that's something that really we have to pay attention to because if you're not taking care of yourself, it's hard to take care of other people. I yeah. know it's easy for me to say, because I'm not in that situation, but I think you know, just making sure that people are taking care of themselves when they find themselves as a caretaker for others and different generations is really important. I think that uh, that's another thing that women actually are, that's a characteristic of women is that we tend to take care of other people uh, before we take care of ourselves. We're, we're more of that caretaker yeah. kind of personality. Now that doesn't mean yeah. every woman is, but right. in general, yeah. that's what we do. And I see that a lot in my studio as mm -hmm. well. And I talk to people about, think about a bank account. If you are constantly pulling money out and never putting money in, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. pretty soon the well runs dry. Yep. That bank account is empty and you can yeah. no longer pull anything out. So yeah. if you don't put deposits into yourself, then you can't care for other people. So yeah. don't think of taking care of yourself as selfish. That's not true. Self-care right. is not selfish. Yeah. You have to put that money into yourself. You have to put that care of eating well, of moving well, of managing your stress. All of that has to happen so that you are well enough, yes. vigorous enough to help where you're needed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it's so, so difficult for so many families because they don't have the resources to help take care of an elderly parent. Um, or for daycare or childcare. And so the grandparent tends to just get the, the, uh, the brunt of that. And right. so, and they readily go for it. Right. So I wanna open it up to questions. I wanna see what people have um, to talk about. Um, and Patricia, you're saying the, it makes so much sense to say self-care is not selfish. You are correct, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, you know, but um, Diane, as you're yeah. going through the questions, I'd love to tell this little story about how I met Chris. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yes. Yes. In Tai Chi. Yes. It's, really, it's, 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 it's bad on us, but it, it, it has a happy ending. So um, my co-author and I were in um, Chicago at the ACSM Health and Fitness Summit. And we were doing a presentation on the book. And um, now, as you said, my, my co-author is the exercise physiologist. And so Chris was in the audience. And at the end, Chris asked a question about what do we see as the benefits of Tai Chi? Because it wasn't specifically mentioned in the book. And my co-author, exercise physiologist, says, I, I don't know much about Tai Chi. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I didn't know what to say. I'm not the exercise physiologist. So after the meeting, Chris came up to me, introduced himself. 
and told me who he was and what he was doing. And I, I was really interested in it. And he was so gracious instead of, um, after I found out what he did, instead of saying to, the, to my co-author, well, then you aren't very well informed. <laughs> he was very gracious. So I got, you know, we exchanged cards. I went home and the very next day I got an email from a colleague of mine. She's about 10 years older than I am, very, very active. And she said, what do you know about Tai Chi? Because mm-hmm. I've been doing yoga and I'm doing these things, but I'm almost 80 and I feel like I need a gentler form of exercise to stay active. So what do you know about Tai Chi? I said, Bonnie, I don't know anything about it, but I know someone who does. That's awesome. So I contacted Chris. I've interviewed him twice for my blog and he introduced me to you. So it was a great story. And, and if yes. we do a second edition, we'll definitely talk more about Tai Chi. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Right, right. Chris Cinnamon and I will absolutely make sure that that happens. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's right. I have a question for you to um, hear about um, the, this was in the Wall Street Journal article as well. Um, somebody's asking about the supplement resveratrol. Do I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that, that's a big buzzword. You know, that's yeah. a, um, so can you address that? Yeah, it is. It's, it's interesting. You know, um, the nature of, of science and food is reductionist. So if, if we know that oranges help prevent colds, let's say, what is it about it? Well, it's the vitamin C. Well, it's the vitamin C, how much and what form? And so we get, you know, down to this micro level. And that's kind of one of the things that's happened with resveratrol. It's a compound that's found in um, like red grapes, therefore in red wine. And, it, and it's found in peanuts, it's found in other foods as well, but it has this um, very potent antioxidant effect. So people are really pushing the supplements as, of resveratrol you know, for anti-aging. And while I would say, eat your red grapes, eat peanuts, you know, you're not gonna get very much from a supplement that's gonna help. Recently, another exercise physiologist who, who's out of the UK that I really like, um, did this th- uh, an infographic about exercise is, is one glass of is red wine better than exercise? And he did this comparison and boiled down all the numbers. He said, you have to drink a thousand glasses of red wine to get the benefits that you do for one hour of exercise. Whoa. So, you know, I just don't think that taking resveratrol supplements are really the answer. As I said, enjoy the foods that contain resveratrol, but I would not buy resveratrol supplements. You know, that's funny. I just remembered I, I had a client a long time ago that, um, she was doing strength training with me and also adding the Tai Chi. And I remember she left class one day and she goes, this is better than a glass of wine. <laughs> and yes. and I, I took that as a compliment. Yes. That, you know, yes. instead of taking the wine for stress relief, instead yeah. of yeah. The wine to wind down, right. the Tai Chi actually helped yeah. her and it was yeah. healthier for her. And yeah. she realized that. So, you know, and I always say I get, I get up early and I, I go to the Y and I do these exercise classes and, or, you know, I'll get out and do whatever for exercise. And I've always said, no matter how many times you don't want to put on the shoes or you don't want to go do the exercise. I've never once said after exercise, I wish I hadn't done that. Right. Never once. <laughs> so sometimes you, you need that little motivation to get out the door at seven 30 in the morning to go to a class. But right. at, when it's done, I'm like, boy, I'm glad I did that. <laughs> And that's part of back to it's never too late. Yeah. It's part of establishing a habit, establishing a class, finding a class that you want to go to, your Tai Chi class or your dance class, Mm -hmm. Um, establishing a habit of walking with your neighbors, you know, um, establishing a habit by hiring a personal trainer, getting some Mm -hmm. strength training. The power of habit is huge yeah. and it's never too late to start that habit. And it does help, you know, because it's when you don't feel like getting up in the morning or you don't feel like going to class, it's like, yeah, but this is what I do. Mm-hmm. And when you're done, you feel great, right? Yeah. You're, you're not, Absolutely. there's never a regret for that. Absolutely. Never, ever. I have another question here about water. Mm-hmm. Um, the importance of water, the amount of water, you know, there's so much uh, out there about women should drink this amount of water, yeah. 96 ounces, or men should yeah. drink this. And um, can you address that? Yeah, that, it, it, it's hard to say the exact amount. Um, my, my co-author, Bob, is really a hydration expert. And he's, he likes to say the human body is a leaky bag of water with legs. And <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're just, oh. we're, we're constantly losing and gaining fluid. 
Um, you know, that idea of eight glasses of water a day, I mean, it, it comes from the fact that we usually tend to lose about that amount of water a day through urine and, and, and breathing and, and sweating, but it, it's not anything that's magical. I'd say for most older folks, because we do tend to, to not concentrate urine as well, so we might lose water more with urine. Our thirst mechanism isn't as acute, especially when we exercise. So there are reasons that we should pay more attention to hydration as we get older. But I think the best thing to do is make sure you're drinking plenty of fluids with your meals. That's mostly where we're gonna get fluids. So you don't need to carry around the gallon jug of water all day, drink plenty of fluids with meals. Um, and then probably the easiest thing to do is look at your urine. If it's a, a pale straw color and you're urinating frequently throughout the day, then you're probably getting sufficient fluids. If you're not urinating very much and it's very concentrated yellow color or orangey color, you're probably dehydrated. So you wanna find that balance. Um, I used to do in, work in sports nutrition and I'll never forget this one basketball player who said to me, you know, kind of on this, the sly, how much should I be peeing a day? And I said, well, you know, it depends. Why are you asking? Because I only pee once a day. It's not enough. You need to be drinking more fluids. You need to be hydrating. You're sweating, you're playing basketball, you're practicing. You should not be just urinating once a day. So, wow. you, know, some people just, you know, they just don't get it. They don't get it. Right. So that idea of hydrating well throughout the day. The other thing is back to the foods that you eat. You know, you, it does count uh, fruits, vegetables, soup, tea, coffee, all of those contain water as well. So it doesn't just have to be water. If you're eating now, the summer's coming up and you've got berries and melons, those are really high water containing fruits. You know, eating plenty of those throughout the day too is another way to increase your water intake. That's awesome. Um, you know, you, you hear people say, oh, I, caught, I drink coffee, but that doesn't count because that's dehydrating. Um, but it does actually count, it does doesn't count. it? Yeah, it does count. And um, you know, it, it, you, you, may, you may not hold on to all the water as much when it's a little decaffeinated, but it definitely counts. And I hate to say it, but even alcohol counts. It's not totally dehydrated. Now, do <laughs> we want people to go out and run a 10K and, and then just drink alcohol for their hydration? No, water first, you know, then maybe enjoy the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's an interesting point, which actually um, goes along with exercise as well, is there is such a thing as too much water. Yes, you know, water absolutely. is good for us, but the, the hyponatremia is actually real. Now, it yes. usually happens in athletes, but, yep. um, you know, don't go overboard yep. just because water is good, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, many stories of people that um, particularly in, in uh, charity races, the, the, the runners that are at the back of the pack that feel like they have to stop at every single water, stop and drink and drink and drink. And then by the time they get to the finish line, they, they've over consumed water and they have hyponatremia. Very, it could be a very serious medical issue. And that, like I said, that goes along with the idea of there is <laughs> such a thing as too much, too hard of exercise yeah. as yeah. well. That's where that Tai Chi comes in again is balancing out your hard and your soft. Yes, you need strength training, absolutely. Yes, you need to really focus on that cardiovascular training, but Tai Chi is a piece of the puzzle. And in order to make your whole puzzle um, be beautiful, mm -hmm. right, you need all of those pieces. Don't yeah. overdo with any one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do we have any other questions from our audience? We've had a great um, discussion here about food and fitness after 50. We're obviously both after 50 and intend to stay here for a while, <laughs> Lord willing, that, that's, yeah. that's where we go. <laughs> but any other questions before we wrap it up? Um, I don't see anything in here. Um, Thank you very much, Christine. How, again, this is the book, Food and Fitness After 50. There we go, I've got it now. Um, I actually have a couple books on Amazon as well. Um, I have an Eating Simply book. It's not as, it's, it's just about um, general guidance. It's not the science that Christine and Bob have put into their book. Um, but, and then obviously open the door to Tai Chi as well. Um, both of those books are on Amazon, obviously food and fitness after 50. You can see my little pink tabs. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's like that too. I have different tabs in it. For see, right. 
right? Christine, if people want to ask, oh, wait a minute, there's one late question here. What's your take okay. on red meat? Ah, well, you know, that's a, that's kind of a tough question because some people choose to, to not eat meat for ethical reasons. And I completely understand and respect that. <clears throat> but I think if you're going to consume red meat, um, it's it, for older folks, there's some really important nutrients there. So it's easy to get a nutrient rich package in a small portion. So the key would be lean red meats, Anything that has the word loin in it or round in it is lean. So that's a good thing to think about like a pork loin or a um, round steak, you know, something with the round or loin. Um, and then keep your portion small, about four ounces is all you need. Yeah. And that's gonna give you lots of nutrients like iron and zinc and some of the things that we may, minerals we may not get as much in our other, other um, foods that we choose. So if you choose red meat, keep the portion small, choose lean. Awesome, thank you. Um... How can people get in touch with you? I mean, obviously buying your yeah. book, but you know, if they want to be involved with your blogs, reading your yeah. blog, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, my website is just my name, chrisrosenbloom.com. And on there, um, there's a place to sign up for my blog. It's free and it's also not monetized. So you won't see a lot of ads. And so it's, um, yeah, it's just called Fit to Eat and it's on my website. And my email address is chrisrosenbloom at gmail.com. And I welcome questions. Uh, you might just see that question turned into a whole blog column. So um, I love getting questions from folks that are listening and, and reading my stuff. Excellent, thank you. And if you're in, interested in Chi, <laughs> if you're interested in learning more about it, um, Open the Door to Tai Chi <clears throat> is a great way to introduce yourself to Tai Chi. Our website is Tai Chi System. It's a singular, Tai Chi System.com. You can sign up for our video membership. You can learn some Tai Chi on your own time, in your own space. You know, ideally, you do want to find a class. You want to find an instructor. And we have opened the door to Tai Chi instructors around the world. But, you know, if you just want to try a little bit, that video membership site is awesome. You can find it at TaiChiSystem.com. And if you're a fitness professional and you are actually interested in learning a little bit more about Tai Chi and you want to become an instructor to open up a class in your community. We also teach people how to teach Tai Chi. That's also on our Tai Chi system.com website. So a little bit of introduction to Tai Chi. And if you want to move forward and actually become an instructor, we have that um, support as well. If you have questions that you want to ask me, Diane at Tai Chi system.com, you can email me at any time. I welcome that. Just as Chris welcomes questions about nutrition, you want to ask me about anything about exercise and especially about Tai Chi, I would welcome that. So with that, I think we will take our leave. Um, thank you so much again, Chris, especially as you being sick and you know <laughs> taking the time to sit in front of the computer and even though voice was a little low that's okay you did well <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> well thanks so much diane Appreciate truly it. truly thank you because the support for the aging community is something um we want everybody to be able to move into their um golden years with as much health and vitality as possible and our whole society will benefit from that absolutely so, Thank you very much, everybody. Hope you have a good rest of your day and we'll see you later. Thank you.